Okay, cutting room floor video here. Part two of our deeper dive into the theme of witness throughout the book of Revelation. You know, and I'll say here just real quick, uh, there's a few reasons why I'm a little hesitant about a hyper-futuristic view of the book of Revelation. Partly because I'm not so sure that's what apocalyptic literature does. I think apocalyptic literature pulls back the curtain not only on the future, but on life in the present, even life in the past. Uh, two, I think to have a hyper-futuristic view of the book of Revelation is to miss a lot of the really important stuff that the book is aiming to communicate to the original churches that it was written to in the first century, uh, as well as the church for us as well, too, in the present day and age. Uh, and then, But then lastly, like when you have this hyper-futuristic hyper view of the book of Revelation, or you're viewing the book of Revelation as sort of this decoder key book on you know explaining how the, the future is all going to play out and, and go down, uh, you can miss just some of the major themes that are coming through out of this very apocalyptic, symbolic book. I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't future elements in the book and that we can't get a very cool picture of the hope that is ours, but when that's all you're seeing out of the book of Revelation or the only way you're using the book, you miss some really important themes that are meant to challenge and stir both the church uh, in the first century, but also the church today. And one of those themes is the theme of witness. For instance, I don't know if you ever noticed uh, that in, in the very first chapter of the book, when Jesus is first being introduced, he's being introduced both as the firstborn from the dead um, and also the ruler of the kings on the earth. But actually the very first thing that we learn about him uh, is that he is the faithful witness. Right? When John's writing, he says he's writing from Jesus Christ. This is verse 5 of chapter 1. The faithful witness. Right? And so you ask the question, okay, so what does it mean that Jesus is the faithful witness? Even before we're told that he's the firstborn from the dead or the ruler of the kings of the earth. Like one of these major themes throughout the book is that it's this theme of witness. So what does it mean that Jesus is the faithful witness? And essentially what that means is that uh, Jesus is the climactic revelation. As the book of Revelation is the revealing of Jesus, uh, it is the, ultimately the revealing of the true living God. Jesus Christ himself is the climactic revelation of the true living God. He is the climactic revelation of all of God's purposes and intentions for his creation. He is the climactic revelation of God's plan of salvation. Right? And again, if part of the goal of the book is to draw the nations away from worship of all these false gods into worship of the living God, well, it's going to be faithful witnessing that does that. And so Jesus, first and foremost, is the faithful witness. Uh, just real quick, so when you begin to see the book as this unfolding book about, partly, at least in part, this great theme and activity of witness, what you happen to notice uh, is some cool stuff like it really is a war or a conflict or a battle of words or a battle of mouths. Right? You see all this activity and this conflict coming out of mouths uh, in combat. So, for instance, Jesus himself, right? Let's go back to our trusty uh, sketchbook here. Like Jesus himself, when he's pictured in the beginning of the book and also at the end of the book, coming back on that, you know, that white horse and the final scene of victory and conquest, right? His weapon of choice is a sharp two-edged sword, but he's not holding it in his hand. It's coming out of his mouth, right? He's engaging warfare with the words of his mouth. Uh, or, you know, we talk about this mock trinity uh, that we uh, got introduced to in the last video or we're going to be introduced to a little bit more in chapter 12, right? Again, we saw that uh, part of Satan's tactics in luring the nations away from worship of the living God and to these false gods is by himself becoming a counterfeit trinity, right? So he's got, uh, just as the true God has Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, Satan has his dragon, beast one and beast two, or the false prophet. And when we look at these characters, right, their main action, a lot of their main action is coming out of their word, uh, their mouths. So the dragon, for instance, uh, when we're first introduced to him, he's trying to consume Christ, defeat Christ. But we also find him having a position in heaven where, uh, with his mouth, he's giving accusation against the brothers. Right? But after Christ is resurrected and ascends to the throne, right, that is the climactic defeat of the dragon. And the dragon is cast out of heaven, and he can no longer give that accusation. And so it's this great song of celebration that the dragon, the accuser of the brethren, has been thrown out. When he's thrown out, he gets all mad, and so he goes in hot pursuit of the church, who's been kept, who was swept away into the wilderness. We'll talk about all of this when we get into chapter 12. But one of his chief tactics for the church in the wilderness is to, tr is to drown them 
with this river or this flood that comes out of, guess, his mouth, right? Perhaps symbolic of uh, Satan trying to do what he does all over the place and trying to deceive the church with false truth, with false doctrine, with false words, and to sweep her away uh, with that. Another, anyway, chief part of his warfare. Or you, you meet his little beast guy, right? And the first thing we're told about this beast in chapter 13 is that he is given a mouth <laughs> so that he can utter blasphemies and false truths against the living God, right, to lead the people astray. You know, or you think about, again, uh, the sixth trumpet and this uh, demonic, uh, uh, these demonic troops that come and kill off a third of mankind from the east of uh, the Euphrates. And what actually kills them, but it's the stuff that comes out of the mouths of the horses, right? The fire, the smoke, the sulfur, all from that bottomless pit. Okay, again, just highlighting as you read through the book. Go read through it sometime and just notice how much warfare is, is coming out of the mouth. Uh, for instance, the church uh, in chapter 14, uh, they're described as ones in, whom, in whose mouth there were no lies. Okay, and, okay, but that's to get us to this whole other side over here. Uh, part of the reason for that is the church is called to be prophetic witness. Right? Just as Jesus is the faithful witness, so John bears witness to the truth, we're told in chapter 1, by writing down what he sees. And then the church is called to read it, to keep it, and to bear witness to this revelation. Uh, chapter 11. Uh, they are the... You know, they are literally symbolically referred to as witnesses. Or this whole idea of a lampstand, right? We're shining the light of something else into a darkened world. And the question we, were at, we left with last time, well, okay, so what exactly is the content of this witness? And uh, we've been talking about this term prophetic witness as we've been working our way through the book so far. And uh, maybe just that first word there. Well, part of the reason that we use that word prophetic witness is because we're told that these witnesses uh, that's part of what they're doing. They're prophesying against the idolatrous culture, which is what it means to be a prophet. All throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the prophets, uh, they railed against two things. One, idolatry, the rampant idolatry of the nation of Israel, God's people. And two, the detestable practices that the people were doing in obedience to those idols. Right? And so in the same way, the church is called to be a prophetic witness. We're called to confront, to challenge, to expose the rampant idolatry in the culture around us. And to also rail against all the detestable and the unjust and the sinful practices that people do in worship and obedience to those false gods. Right? The things that the God of money or the God of success or the God of beauty demands from us in order to, to have them. Right? Or whatever. So that's what the part of what it means to be a prophetic witness. We call out that, call that out. We confront it. We challenge it. Expose it. Two other things that are talk, talk mentioned about the church is that they hold to the testimony of Jesus. Our main, the main content of our witness is the true faithful witness himself. Okay, we in our words and in our lives, we point to Jesus as the climactic revelation of the truth of God, the purposes of God, the salvation of God. All right, so the very simple answer, surprise, surprise, what is the content of our witness? It is Jesus, the faithful witness himself. Uh, John bears witness to what he saw about Jesus. We're called to take that revelation and live it out in our witness as well, too. So we bear witness, or we hold to the testimony of Jesus himself. We also keep the commandments of God, right? Uh, meaning that, uh, this is chapter 12, when it's describing the church as the ones who hold to the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God, Meaning that we're not like the rest of the idolatrous people who keep the commandments of their false gods. We keep the commandments of the true living God in our testimony to him. The last thing you'll find about the church in their witness throughout the book is that uh, we follow the lamb wherever he goes. All right, you remember that part of cli Jesus' climactic witness to God is through being the lamb. He is the conquering lion but his method of conquest is always lamb-like, right? He conquers by being the lamb who was slain. And so to the church, in our witness to the truth, and our witness to God's salvation, and our witness to his plans and purposes, we do that lamb-like. We do it following the lamb that was slain wherever he goes. And that's why you see in chapter 11, 
the church participating in the sufferings of the king uh, at the hands of the, the beast. And as they throw themselves at the mercy of God and in the confidence of God's faithfulness, he is faithful to them and he draws us then ultimately into the victory of Christ. And it's when the surrounding nations see our lamb-like testimony and see the faithfulness of God and drawing us into the victory of Christ that they turn and they fear the living God and they give glory to him, which is the point of the whole book or is part of the aim of the whole book to draw the nations away from worship of these false gods into worship of the true and living God. So... Don't just read the book of Revelation in a hyper-futuristic way as some decoder key for the future, but just take notice of the rich themes that are going about there throughout the book, and in particular, take notice of the rich theme of witness, right? Observe it, let it sink in, and let it challenge us and call us, together with this church, to our faithful responsibility to give witness to the one true faithful witness himself, Jesus Christ. So that people from every tongue, tribe, and nations might turn from their false idols and find the joy, freedom, and ultimately eternal life uh, that is offered to them. Okay, that's it. Talk more next time. See ya.